What's up, everybody? Oh, happy Tuesday. After a holiday, hopefully, for a lot of people, if you're in the U.S. at least. Maybe you got a day off work. Maybe you worked anyway. <laughs> like I did. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, so we're going to do the usual. We'll let people get in here. Um, what, can I, what can I talk about that's interesting? Oh, uh, so over the weekend, I went to a uh, newer local fish store. Uh, I've been there once before, but their main focus is salt water, but they have a small freshwater section. And I wasn't necessarily there to buy anything, although I ended up buying something because <laughs> they had a, a particular species of plant in that I haven't grown yet and I would was interested in having, so... They had a really nice one, by the way. But I was there to meet uh, Master Breeder Dean, right? Uh, we had He was looking for some vinegar eel cultures. And it's <laughs> so funny. We were, we were talking on a phone call, uh, trying to arrange how we were going to meet each other and what was going to work best. And uh, it was like, well, I'm going out to this store here at this time. And I was like, oh, that's like halfway between your house and mine anyway. So I'll just I'll meet you there. And he got stuck in a ton of traffic. And I was like, well, just text me when you get there. And, and hopefully uh, I won't be too far behind you, right? Because uh, I, was, I was running to grab some lunch and I needed to eat and then grab cultures. And you guys have seen my, my previous video on vinegar eels, right? So I just have these like big wine bottles full of cultures. And I haven't really touched them uh, since I made that video. Because I haven't had any reasonable number of babies. That's not true. That's not true. I used one culture worth. But otherwise, all my other cultures, and I made seven out of that, <laughs> after that video. So I had seven wine bottles worth of vinegar eel cultures. I haven't touched them since. And that's, you know, closing in on a year and a half, two years. And I, I get there and I look and they're still doing just fine. I can see the little, little vinegar eels wiggling around inside there. And it's like, okay. So I just grabbed... Two full wine bottles of cultures, and it's like that should be enough to start Master Breeder Dean off. He was looking for like a little starter, and I'm just gonna bring him two full mature cultures. <laughs> uh, and we were like, we're planning to meet and maybe hang out for like 15 minutes. You know, he's supposed to go home, he had some stuff to take care of, and he's just spent some time with his wife. And I was trying to get some stuff done around my house, and uh. We're out in the parking lot an hour and a half later. We're finally like, oh, yeah, we should both probably go home now. <laughs> it just shows you, like, we haven't sat and talked for a while. So, of course, we just had a ton of stuff. And none of it's, like, really important. It's it's nothing, like, uh, super interesting. Half of it was non-fish related. But we had this amusing conversation about, for uh, probably ten minutes or so, about old fish stores and you know do you remember this store and you remember this and you remember that and uh it was all talking about uh, a little bit in kind of connection to the ocean aquarium video that co-op put out recently where uh jimmy and zenzo went there and, and did the interview with the owner uh and you know just talking about how these these old school stores like this if they don't necessarily have uh, family who are going to take it over, they're disappearing, right? And their their stories are gone. And it's it's cool to document the story of some of these stores that do things a little different. And it, you know, it's just one of those things where that's something as, as you know, Master Breeder Dean and I both get older, we look back on how many stores in the Seattle area do we remember that were different, or, or did something in a unique way, or were known for this thing, and for whatever reason, don't exist today. Uh, an example was this shop that uh, was on like the bottom floor of a three-story building, and a pipe burst at the third story, and uh, they they refused. To, like their their insurance or whatever refused to pay out for all the damage to everything and it just put them out of business. 
So we were talking about some stuff like that where it's just like you know, these little things you don't think about. And then you go down the line and you're like, oh, do you remember this story? You remember how awesome it was and this, that and the other thing. And and the way the hobby changes all that kind of stuff. So it was just uh, two, two old men babbling. <laughs> It's really what it comes down to. <laughs> Two old men babbling about fish. <laughs> Mostly about stores. And not not necessarily like what we were doing uh, for for projects. But he's got some, some projects in mind that he needed vinegar eels for. So I brought him a bunch of vinegar eels. Because I'm not necessarily using mine at the moment. That was my... That's my weekend. Other than like... I'm still not done editing the fish room tour. I'm working on that. But... Uh, it should be done for this Saturday, at least the first part. It'll be two parts. Um, we'll do the the main room that has the Guppy Mansion, and then the kind of the rest of the tanks around the house in the the two other rooms where I keep a majority of my tanks. And I think I think I've burned enough time letting people get here. Let's get on topic, shall we? <laughs> you guys know that this is just like a crazy train of fish nonsense every week, right? I have something in my eyes driving me crazy. I can't get it out. All right. I think I got it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to sit here doing this the whole time I'm trying to talk. So, I, w I got an email today, and I recognized the email, and I was pretty confident it was a, a member of the, the channel. So, I w went against my normal rule, which is uh, to... <laughs> immediately answer some things when I'm behind on other things. <laughs> so I just say, I skipped the queue a little bit. So I played favorites. I'm sorry. Other people in the queue that are waiting for answers. I know I've been trying to get good time to catch up, but work has been just murder on me. And it had to do with this wind bladder issue. And that's, that's what's kind of posed this topic. And that person is in chat, which is great. <laughs> and I don't want to dog on you. Just want to be clear, but I think this is part of the story. I just get a simple email. It's help fish with a parent's wind bladder issue. That's the title. And the body of the email is just best way to treat. <laughs> so that requires a lot of questions. Because in my experience, swim bladder issues are super complicated. And, and don't worry, some stories are coming. I promise you. So I asked these questions. and I've got the email up just so that I can make sure I didn't screw up. What type of fish is it? What are the parameters of your tank? Ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, GH, KH, pH, etc. Whatever you can test for. What is the temperature of your tank? Have you changed your feeding at all in the last two weeks? What kind of food are you feeding the fish and how often? Does the fish appear to be bloated? Is the belly a lot larger than what you've usually seen? Does it have a sunk in belly? Is it a lot smaller than you've usually seen? So these are all the questions I asked for some answers back, and I got some. <laughs> and I know you answered them. I'll try not to call you out. You just ratted yourself out in chat. <laughs> um, and, and so I got some answers, and just I was kind of busy at work so I didn't necessarily get to answer right away but uh, I, I told a story okay and we're going to get to that story in a minute I promise so it's a it's a glowfish tetra so right a white skirt tetra the glowfish variety uh, fish has now been put into quarantine okay temperature was 78.2 the KH of 91 so that's the doing the TDS as opposed to the degrees of KH but both are fine that's um, about three degrees of KH, roughly. 103 GH, so that's somewhere between three and four degrees. pH 7.1. Uh, NH30, NO2, so ammonia, ni or nitrate, right? Um, all these things. Zero, NO37, so we got a little bit of nitrate. PO4. You guys know what that is? Uh, 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 PO4. Come on, chat. Come on. I know there's a little delay, so I'm, I'm being kind of a kind of a, a jerk about it. That's phosphate. Just in case you're curious. 3.5. So 
not horrifically high, but uh, maybe it, for some people that might be high. I don't think it's that bad. Right? And then TDS, 286 overall. So overall TDS of the tank is 286. So we're not crazy hard water. Okay? Feeding every other day. Haven't changed that. Using the Bug Bites Flake and Extreme Floating Pellets. Doesn't appear to be bloated. Does not have a large nor sunken belly. Noticed him two nights ago. But it was late to move him. Then couldn't find him. Was a little worried he might have died. Might have got ate by the shrimp. Did a water change this morning. Found him floating sideways in the plants. Thought he was dead, but then noticed, noticed that the mouth was moving, but didn't appear to be gasping, just moving kind of normally. Uh, can still swim up right occasionally, but mostly on the side. Gills look to be normal color, sporadic bursts of energy. And then there was a video. And uh, I'm, I didn't write the video just because I kind of didn't have time. I worked until like 10 minutes before my stream was supposed to start. But the fish is... For the most part, on their side, and, and swimming kind of lazily. So a little burst of energy, and then kind of floating for a bit, and a little burst of energy, and then floating for a bit. So, okay, what what does all this mean? It can mean a lot of things, and that's the problem. Swim bladder issues are really, really, really hard to diagnose simply. We could have a small amount of constipation. And there was another follow-up uh, based on a story that I'm going to tell where uh, our, our, our hero here <laughs> fed some peas to the fish and seemed to get a, a little bit of food in the system. But what we're trying to do is just in case the fish is constipated and that is putting pressure on the swim bladder, we're going to feed them a food that just kind of cleans them out. It's like if... You're having some kind of guttural issue, and you have, like, a salad to push everything out, right? Lots of lots of veg and fiber. That's what we're doing with a pea, right? We're feeding we're feeding some simple boiled peas. The easiest way is to get frozen peas. You can microwave them for a few seconds or just quickly par-blanch them in some mildly boiling water. And you pull the skin off so you get the pea inside, the guts, if you will, of the pea. And you can use that almost like a paste and feed your fish. It's actually an extremely healthy food, especially for your vegetable feeding fish, because it's got all sorts of lovely pea protein, which is something we use in quite a lot of our fish foods, is pea protein. So why not get it direct from the source? All right, so what's going on? This is the tough part. Bentley is bad at diagnosing fish disease. Very bad. There's only a few things that I know for certain, but... There are little, little hints that can teach us a direction to go. And this is where I want to talk about this. So in this particular case, the pea is a good thing. And I would be feeding the peas every day for a few days. And see if just in case, maybe we've got some kind of constipation issue going on. But we don't have that big bloated belly that is normally the sign of constipation. Okay? But we're just going to try. We're going to try and push some stuff out just in case. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our fish's poo, as long as they stay alive, and look if it's white. If it's brown or green or even kind of a yellowish color, all of those are okay. Green because we're feeding it peas. Brown is brown and kind of a yellowy brown is a more normal color for fish poo, depending on the food. But white, white is a problem. And usually what that means is either A, the fish doesn't really have any food in their system, or B, most commonly, well, commonly, we associate that with some kind of parasite problem. And that the parasites are eating a lot of the food that the fish is trying to digest. And that's where we're getting that white poo instead of the color from the fish food that we feed our fish. Now, let's say it's not that. Okay, so what's the first thing I want to do? Me, personally, I'm going to dose a little bit of salt. And I like using a marine salt or a reef salt. Uh, there's lots of different options out there. Aquarium Co-op was trying to do their own salt, but then shipping, it's a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> things like that. But uh, there's there's quite a few brands. I think Red Sea has a good marine salt is the one that I like to use. But we dose this extremely low. So we're talking like 
one tablespoon per 10 to 20 gallons. If you have Corydoras in your tank, one per 20 gallons. If you don't have Corydoras or something else that is uh, very sensitive to salt, one tablespoon per 10 gallons. I like to think of this like a very light therapeutic dose. We're getting a little extra mineral content in the water just in case. We're getting that little salt in there to help just in case there's some kind of external parasite. And one thing that I did notice in the video for, for you who's watching, I know you're watching, your fish's gills are sitting ever so slightly open, more so than what I would consider normal. And while the fish doesn't look like they're gasping a lot and they're not flaring their gills real big or their bills aren't super red, Having them slightly open usually means there's something going on, potentially something like a gill fluke. Not always, but something is going on that's stressing the fish and forcing them to hold their gills open a little bit more. And that's bad for the fish. So this is where I look at the therapeutic dose of salt. I'm hoping that little bit of salt will help if there's some kind of parasite in there. If it's, it's not holding them really wide open, so it's not a real bad issue. But if there's something in there, this can help kind of knock those off, so to speak, without having to use a medicine right away. Now, let's say that doesn't help. And feeding the peas doesn't help. We're already at a reasonably high temperature, right? So we're probably not looking at a fish that got too cold. Where do we go from there? At that point, I would usually then worry that we might have some kind of bacterial issue occurring. And if the fish is still going, this is where I would use an antibiotic. Now, you could use the antibiotic at the same time that you use the salt, okay? I would not use, despite how many times certain people will preach about it, erythromycin. Because usually the kind of bacterial issues, in my experience, that cause swim bladder issues are what we call gram-negative. And erythromycin doesn't treat those very well. But, as Krager's fish has mentioned in chat, metroniadazole does a very good job of treating. And metro is a super commonly available medication, at least within the U.S. I know a lot of countries make it really hard to get medication. And in that case, it's going to be very tough for you. And you might just have to call it a day with that fish, get them sequestered, use a little clove oil... If they're alone in like a container, that way you put them basically to sleep. And then while they're asleep, you just get them, fish them out, put them in a Ziploc bag, and freeze them. That's the most humane way to euthanize your fish, okay? If you don't want to go to that much work, that's your choice, but that's the most humane way. Now, metronidazole is a very effective antibacterial okay it's a very very effective medication it's not the one shot wonder it won't kill everything under the sun but man metronidazole is pretty dang good just make sure you follow the directions on dosing the metronidazole if you're going to put it in the water okay there's a little bit of work you need to do to to properly dose it in the water dance fish has a fantastic video about that let me see if i can hunt it down Because he uses metronidazole quite a lot. Aha! Found it. Here we go. We'll link that in chat. That's Dan Fish's video talking about fish medicine. And literally in the thumbnail, the first thing he's doing is holding up a big jug of Metro. Uh, that, that's Metro is one of probably the, the best broad-spectrum antibiotics for gram-negative bacteria out there. Just keep in mind... Gram negative includes the beneficial bacteria in your filter. This is why we use a quarantine tank when we're using this kind of stuff. Because it can nuke your beneficial bacteria and cause some kind of crash if you're doing it to your big tank. So this is where we use a quarantine tank. Okay? But, that's a really good one. Also, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of people. So if you were a member... There's an aquatic veterinarian that was uh, done in the co-ops members thing over the weekend. It's an extremely good presentation. I have to go catch up and watch it. I've only watched part of it because I just only had so much time. But uh, what I saw was great. 
if that doesn't work. You're at the extent of Bentley's knowledge. However, let me tell you a different story. And this is actually probably going to become an in-depth solutions video so that it's just out there in the wild, outside of a stream. Uh, three weeks ago, my cousin Henry calls me. You guys remember cousin Henry, Petco Horror Stories. He's a fun, jovial guy, big, bushy beard, right? Cousin Henry. Love that guy to death. He's one of my best friends in the whole wide world. Calls me and he's like, hey, cuz, I got a problem with my convict cichlid. That's right. Cousin Henry has convict cichlids, but just one. One big, beautiful male. <laughs> and eventually, I'm going to go film this thing because he's, he's a handsome boy. It's like, I'm, he's having trouble swimming correctly. I think he's he's having something go wrong with his swim bladder and I I've seen I was trying to look some stuff up and I don't want to try to like use a needle or whatever. What do you think is wrong? I go, okay. Let's let's go over the last couple weeks. What's been different? Let's talk about your tank. We talked for like half an hour. I want to be clear. I asked a lot of questions. He told me a lot of stuff. But here's the short version. The short version of the story is this. He keeps his tank unheated in his home, but it's typically between about 70 and 72 degrees. So not too cold. Not maybe as warm as it would be like optimal, but this fish has been living in this tank for a couple years, is a full adult, very healthy, eats quite voraciously, is what you would expect of a convict cichlid, a little territorial with the, the one other fish that's in there, which is a gigantic common pleco. It's like this big. In this, this uh, I think it's like a 75-ish, I can't remember the actual size, but it's a bow front quarter tank. And I can't remember how those gallonages scale up. But anyway, so he's telling me what's going on. He's swimming upside down. He goes, you know, I know it, it got really cold and this tank sits in a corner by two different windows. And one of those windows, we've got plastic over it because the seal's not so great on it. And I just haven't had time to fix it. And we had that big cold snap where it was in the teens for several days. Okay. So we got a big placostomus. We got a full adult convict cichlid. And we got a turtle in this tank, but the turtle's kind of in winter hibernation. Just kind of not doing much. It's so, like, okay, we got a kind of high bio load. I know you just got a simple hang on back on this thing, but you do water changes because yeah, yeah. And, and when I realized it was kind of cold, I started doing some water changes and slowly warming the water up. And he goes, I, you know, I try to gravel vac it whenever I can. Like, okay. So when you're doing water changes, you're trying to get all the excess poop out. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. And you clean the filters regularly. And he goes, yeah, I clean the filters about once every three weeks or so. Okay. All right. So we're doing some maintenance. It's like, how much are you feeding him? Is he looking kind of bloated in the belly? And he goes, you know, my my six-year-old is, every so once in a while, you might get just like a fistful of food from the six-year-old because we're trying to make sure the pleco gets food and the, the turtle gets some random stuff. I'm like, all right. And so we're probably got a little cold. And when it gets cold, right, that metabolism slows down a lot. And that convict cichlid's probably just eating the same amount of food. Might be overeating. But that metabolism slowed down. So that belly starts bloating out because he's not processing enough. And all of a sudden, we got a little constipation issue probably going on. And it's got real cold compared to what we're used to. So we got a temperature spike happening. That's going to mess with everything. But we're a tough fish. We're going to swim through this. We can handle it. Okay. So, all right. How much? How big was your last water change? Because oh, I was was this much and i'm like and what's the temperature if you look at it do you have a thermometer or a, a temp gun he goes yeah i've got a thermometer on the tank and it says it's at 68 i go okay so we're getting back it's still a little cold outside at this point in time but it's getting back to its normal temperature so that's okay let's not try to do too many things at once so okay are you still feeding them he goes always oh, just stopped feeding them yesterday i went good don't feed them for another two days what I want you to do is if you've got some frozen peas, either microwave them a little bit or just blanch them real quick in some boiling water. Not very much, just a f like five or six peas. And mush them up 
and try and get him to eat that. And if he won't eat it, call me back and I'll get you this other food called rapashi. And that that'll might be more likely to try that. Okay. While you're also doing this, it's like, all right. All I want you to do is make sure that we're getting plenty of air in there. Just make sure that we got enough movement at the surface that we're getting good air. Because, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I make sure we got an air stone in there. You got a couple those big bar air stones. Like, okay. So try giving him peace for a couple days. Do another water change. Just every day, change like a third of your water and bring the temperature up slowly. So if your t tank's at 68 degrees, try to get your water about 73, 74 degrees that's coming in. That way it'll raise it up about a degree or so. We want to slowly get that temperature back up while we're handling all this cold w winter weather at the time. Okay. So calls me back. Goes, hey, good news. He's When he swims a little bit, every once in a while he'll ride himself and he'll move around. It's only when he's idling that he kind of flips back over and loses control. Okay? It's like if we noticed directly we saw him have a poop. Like, all right, we're, we're on a start. What color was it? He goes, it was just like this kind of dark brown color. All right, good. What we want to make sure is it's not white. So what's probably happening is as the temperature is raising up, his metabolism's coming up, and he's processing some of those things. And that pea is going to help. Is he eating the pea? He goes, yeah, he ate some peas today. He didn't eat them really yesterday. The Pleco did, but he got some today. I practically had to hand feed him, but he ate it. Like, okay, let's keep doing that for another couple days. Don't go to any of your other food. The Pleco will be okay. The turtle will be okay. Just keep doing that stuff. Like, All right. Calls me like a week later. It's like, hey, good news. Tanks back to the temperature that we're used to. He's back to swimming fine. He immediately went and, like, bullied the Pleco because the Pleco had this giant poo, and he seems to hate it whenever the Pleco just doesn't... It has these, like, big stringy poos coming out of himself. Because <laughs> apparently he tries to keep his area clean, and the Pleco doesn't do that very well. <laughs> so what was going on, right? It was a combo of things. That we lost that metabolism, so we weren't able to process as much food. So he got a little bloated, got a little constipated. That put pressure on the swim bladder. As we slowly raise the temperature back up, we get that metabolism kicking back in. We start processing all that extra food we've been storing up in that belly. Get a little less fat there. Have it go, have it go where it needs to go. Does the business. S relieves that pressure and it rights the ship. Now if it... If we did all that and the fish looked good and we didn't get the swim bladder back in place, then we would have to look at potentially some of those things where you see people like, oh, you just take a needle and you put it in your fish and you have to aspirate the bladder. Don't, and don't, don't do that right away to your fish. Never do that, okay? Because you're more likely to hurt it. That's a like last chance desperation. Um, the, the example I can think of is when uh, that story Corey talks about his old puffer Hank, where he was like out of desperation and like knew he was hurting his fish, but it was just anything he could do to try and save his fish's life. That's the only time when I would ever even remotely consider that. And usually I still wouldn't even do that. So there's a little story that'll probably be an actual in-depth solutions. And we'll just have cousin Henry, like sit with me and we'll talk back and forth and make it kind of fun. But, um, I wanted to add that story of a like a swim bladder issue I was able to fix with no medication. I uh, didn't even use salt, even though I love using salt as just kind of a therapeutic thing, right? Just identifying the little combination of things that tells us the most likely problem, which is also the easiest solution, right? Slowly work on getting the temperature up. And one of the things I talked to him about is like, hey, if you need a heater, if you want to make sure you got a heater, he's like, oh, if I think I need a heater, I'll just go buy one. You know, and I was like, well, if you do need one, just come by. I got spares. I'll give you one, especially if he won't eat the peas and you need the other food. I'll give you the heater at the same time. 
And if for some reason we don't do that, I've got spare tanks. We'll set up a, a quarantine tank so that we can use medication and not dose that whole big tank or risk anything with your turtle or anything crazy like that. And you know, it was okay. And then just turns out it's just a little backed up, <laughs> a little cold. kind of needed to just process some stuff and get it out of there. And turned out he was right as rain. So there you go. With that being said, uh, we can go to normal q and I know I babbled a lot longer than usual. And there's some questions early that I want to try and, and get back to. Ah, now my other eye's itching. Jeez. It's an itchy eye day. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. One thing, <laughs> Rico Stan, thank you, buddy. It's like... Rico Stan is like clearly a better YouTuber than me using his member uh, super chat to pimp my membership. <laughs> Which uh, a word on the street is you had Dean on your channel. So I got to go check that bad boy out. So I bet that'll be fun. Even though I know a lot about Dean that most people don't. But I bet, I bet Rico had some cool questions. All right. So, uh, Crontail Half Moon actually specifically asking about a swim bladder issue on adult female bettas. So one day she started swimming head down, so to remove her to shallow water. Fed live Daphne and she improved. Now when I put her back in the main tank, she got back to swim bladder issues a week later. I was feeding bettas pellets. Any advice? Would she be able to breed? Uh, okay, so the first thing I'm going to tell you this is I when she is dealing with that swim bladder issue... I don't know that she would breed because the, the bettas, they have such that intricate dance, right? That, that wrap up that they do. And if they're having issues with their swim bladder, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to do that the way they need to. Uh, as far as what I would be reading into here is that you fed a live food and it improved. You went back to feeding a pellet, went back to having a problem. So what I would think is that fish Either A, that particular pellet is hard for that fish to process. And we need to have some kind of mixture of foods or something that's a little easier and maybe not as big. One thing I've noticed is with some betta pellets is that the pellets are way too large. Uh, especially with smaller bettas like placots, right? And the pellets end up being way too large. And it's actually one of the complaints I had with Extreme's original betta pellet is it was too big. And smaller bettas couldn't really eat it very well. And they changed their size to a smaller, more granule-like. And it's amazing now. We use that in uh, Brother-in-Law James's tank. I quite like it. But, um, my, my guess would be it's a food issue. Because you're, you're, you've, you've moved it to a different tank. You feed some live Daphne and it improves. You return it to the tank. And uh, assuming other, unless there's like... Some major difference. I mean, you're you're probably running all your tests. You're making sure you're not seeing some big spike in nitrate or ammonia or nitrate. nitrite. Uh, you don't have some crazy difference in your hardness between that quarantine tank and your other tank. So unless you're seeing some difference there, which run your tests to make sure, all signs point to one of two things. Is there If there's no temperature difference, there's no parameter difference, either A... There's some kind of stress in that tank. Maybe she's being overly chased by some other more aggressive female, if you have multiple females in the tank, or the male. And that stress is causing issues in the fish that are leading to a swim bladder problem. Or B, that particular fish is really struggling to process that particular pellet. Maybe they're eating too much of it because it just it smells amazing and it's a bigger food, right? So it takes a lot more work to process it down. Then something like live Daphnia, right? Much smaller. Talking about a micro crustacean at that point. And then we're basically getting effectively a constipation issue. The only, the third thing I could possibly think of, and it would usually have to be an older female, would be if they start getting a little egg bound, that could apply pressure to the swim bladder as well. And you would almost need to basically get it back to health by not feeding it and then try and put it around a male and see if they will breed to release some of those eggs to release that pressure off of the rest of her body. Okay. Those would be my, my three go-tos. So my three and uh, all signs point to food to me. Just reading what you're saying. 
<laughs> Joe Davis. Kingfisher's catch. We've all been there. Once ate too much at breakfast buffet and ended up with a swim bladder issue. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, a little bit on my, like, random babble earlier, MNC Aquatics. My LFS is a third-generation store. Pretty cool place. Dude, I... I would sincerely love to go to a place that has had three generations of the same family running it, especially if it was a dedicated fish store and not necessarily a pet store. I've, I've, I've gone to some pet stores that are like multiple generation family running them, but a dedicated fish store that way would be just absolutely rad. I, I would love to be able to visit that. And it doesn't have to be fancy, man. That's the best part. It don't need to be fancy. Uh, Jacob Hill, Bentley, I sent an email last Tuesday or Wednesday. How long does it take you to reply? Right now, it's like 10 business days. <laughs> AKA two weeks. Uh, I'm I'm way behind. And a lot of that is just I've been working like crazy at work. And when I get home, I only have so much time to catch up on my stuff around the house. I'm way behind on my stuff around the house. I should be obvious with the fact that I'm like, I'm still editing my fish room tour. Uh, and <laughs> I, I had to... I did not have very much time over the weekend to dedicate to it because I had to take care of uh, a, a few like medical related things for the members of the house. So, just it's been a it's been a rough like end of December, early January for me as far as my time is concerned. I've gotten way behind on stuff I want to be more caught up on, and I'm trying to get caught up, but uh, sometimes we only have so much time in the day, and we we choose our our time uh, to do a live stream. <laughs> I'll try to get to it, uh, Jacob. I'll go. I'll go hunting and try to get to it. Uh, hopefully, tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow will be slightly quieter at work. I did a lot of stuff today, <sighs> and I'm hoping tomorrow's a little quieter for the for all that work I did today. Uh, how differently from Connor? Do Hygrophila Compact grow from Hygrophila Temple? So, you're talking about Scarlet Temple, which there's a Scarlet Temple that is a Hygrophila, and then True Scarlet Temple, at least to me, is Alternate Thera Rhynechii, which is not a Hygrophila at all. Uh, although, I think they, technically, they renamed it. It used to be a Hygrophila, and they renamed it to Alternate Thera, or maybe it's the other way around. It's where you get my brain a little scattered. However, the, the short answer to this is, is really simple. Uh... Altonanthera Rhynechii, or Scarlet Temple, in order to get that really robust color, needs a little bit of CO2 and some good strong light. Hygrophila Compacta typically doesn't need much more than about medium light, and it will stay a little shorter and get those big wide leaves, right? And that's the, that's the cool thing about Hygrophila Compacta or Hygrophila Compact. Uh, especially if it's spelled with a K where it's the compact, the German way, right? Um, that's the, the big difference is kind of light requirement. While the temple will do okay in medium light, it won't get optimal color. That doesn't matter with the compact versions. They just need enough light to where they're not going to start reaching up and growing tall really fast. And usually you can achieve that at kind of a medium light level. You don't have to go real crazy on them. And other than that, uh, the Hygrophila Compact, bigger leaves than the Temple. The Temple will, if it's very happy, will grow lots of side shoots to get your, your extra plants to propagate and densify your forest, if you will. I know, make it random words up. Uh, where Compact, it doesn't necessarily keep growing tall, but you can get it to grow tall if you don't give it enough light. Where, like, if you don't clip the top of the temple, it will just keep growing taller uh, over time. But it will still throw the side shoots. Where the compact will kind of always throw side shoots. If it's happy. We'll put it that way. Woo! Alright. Leo, you have, like, a couple of questions. I'm going to try and, like, chain them together. Because you just dropped a super chat for four ninety nine. Thank you. So, your first question was, what's your favorite crypt? Yes! Right now, it is probably Jacob's and I Pink. Um, I really like Florida Sunset from Wendetii. I love the Crypt Sri Lanka that I have in the 
Guppy Mansion tank. Uh, I really, really, really like when Crypt Spiralis finally grows in in mass. It looks freaking amazing, uh, which is what's going on in the Leopoldi Angel tank, and you'll see that in the... You'll see all of this stuff literally in the Fisher and Tour. All these plants we're talking about. And, uh... Why is my brain failing me? Oh, uh, one that I, I like that has, like, gotten finicky with me lately is Crypt Axle Rod Eye. And that's just because it's a cool brown color crypt that... Uh, gets a lot taller than most of the Wendetti eyes, so it can fill a reasonable amount of space and gets pretty pretty broad in the leaf and looks pretty amazing. Now, your second part. Uh, what's your opinion on cutting RO water with tap water to get it closer to 7 than 7.6 using for its pH neutralizer on the tap water? It's for a beta. Unless you have really, really, really excessive like general hardness or carbon hardness in your tap water. Don't chase pH. Don't chase pH. Betas can handle a surprisingly wide variety of pH. 7.6 is not out of the realm of where a beta can be happy. Now, if you have super high hardness and you're dealing with a specific species of beta that prefers softer water, then cutting 50-50 RO to tap to bring it down is just fine. Or 25, 75, whatever your, your mixture is that tells you it's going to create this, which is closer to neutral, but still has enough carbon and hardness to maintain that pH. Keep in mind, if you cut all your KH out or you cut your KH under 2 degrees, which is... I think it's, it's somewhere like uh, 60 to 80 parts per million. Uh, or, or uh, so I think it's TDS, not parts per million. I'm trying to remember how they, they rank it versus degrees. D basically, when you do the drop test, two degrees is two drops, right? If you go below two degrees, and optimal really is four degrees carbon hardness, you risk dealing with various crashes because there's not enough carbonate hardness to maintain your pH and keep your parameters stable. So don't overmix your RO because you risk that and that will kill the fish faster than dealing with the hard water. Don't chase pH. Like it, the biggest lesson I have learned when it comes to fish where like you'll see, you'll read an article online it says oh they do optimal in pH blah f that Curl that right out the window. Are the bettas in your local fish store or wherever you're getting them from in that pH and have they been raising that pH the whole time or they have they been surviving just fine in like a pH of 7.8 because that's the local water. Fish are way more adaptable than we think when it comes to some of these parameters. Now, there are certain fish that are not. It's rare, but there are certain fish that are more finicky about parameters. Your, your, most of your bettas, not so much. You're more likely to get a betta that's too old or they're used to way hotter temperature than we're keeping it than necessarily the pH. Now, if you have an extremely high mineral content and you need to soften the water, that's where I would look at cutting the water a little bit as opposed to using a chemical. Don't use chemicals. You can use chemicals to buffer water up. But it's easier to do that with things like crushed coral or aragonite or any of those things that are static and stay there. Or even, if you really have to, salt, baking soda, calcium carbonate. Like some of these things that produce certain beneficial things other than whatever the random chemical buffer you're using is. Anything that is designed to soften water that's a chemical, I'm not a fan. Now, granted, I live in extremely soft water, so really all I have to do is buffer my water up. I get to cheat. I've got it easy. I'm not dealing with, like, liquid rock coming out of my tap water. So if that's what you're dealing with, then that's where I would look at cutting it with some RO to bring that down and make it a little more easy. I hope that helps. Do, 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 do. Anthony, is your first time on stream? Welcome. Is it Lency? Is that how it's supposed to be pronounced? It looks like it's... 
potentially vaguely Italian, but if if I'm wrong, please correct me in chat. <laughs> I I miss I mispronounce my names like crazy, and sometimes I get lucky and get them right. So I like knowing if I got them right or if I'm just way off base. Because uh, I can I've heard some very funny pronunciations of my name, and every time I try my best not to laugh. And I also try my best not to sound like a jerk when I'm like, uh, actually, it's it's pronounced this, right? <laughs> I think the the one that I've heard the most, other than uh, Joel, who loves to like jokingly call me Bentley Pascal, right? Which you know I I've always found funny. It's like our inside joke at this point is Pascoe. <laughs> they they just flat pronounce the e as an e at the end, and it's like, yeah, no, it's just a bad spelling, man. It's just the c just the co sound. It's okay. <laughs> Oh, man. Shade Aquatic Breeder has a convict with his turtle, too. That's funny. That's funny. You and my cousin. Two peas in a pod, man. All right. Um, bum, 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 bum. If for some reason I do miss your question, by the way, don't don't be afraid to repost it. Just don't spam it too much. Man, what is with these, like, random people putting all this, like, junk in chat? I don't understand it. I don't understand what the, the latest Spamarino is. Uh, Bob Purcell. Any tips on keeping good leaf density on Rotala rotundifolia? I have the orange juice variety, but it's more red than orange at the moment. Leaf density. CO2. <laughs> That's the cheater way. Uh, and, and, and the reason why I say that is m in most plants stay better dense when they have that extra CO2. Because it allows them to process more nutrients, photosynthesize more, blah, 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 blah. And also, it can handle stronger light, which is usually what you need to have that dense leaf structure without losing foliage down in the lower portions of the stem. When we do it in lower tech setups, which, I'm um, Bob, I think the tank you're doing, if you're doing orange juice, you probably have some CO2 going in there. Uh, and, and my answer would be crank the CO2 up just a little bit more, right? And if you have your lights on... And you have a little room to increase that light just a little bit. Increase it just a little bit. Just a little, little, little bump. A little boost, right? A little booster shot. <laughs> um, but in low-tech setups, that's when we tend to see like certain plants that we're, we know for having really robust foliage having more minimal foliage because they can only process so much. They can only use so much of the nutrients. So they don't need all that extra foliage that would become wasted energy and potentially kill off some of their low, lower foliage. So it's, it's the plant kind of smartly using the amount of energy it can use optimally without straining itself. That makes sense? That makes sense? Yeah. Or I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> uh... Raphael, have you had a chance to see Green Planet from BBC? The second episode, Water Worlds, is a fascinating look into water plants. Uh, I have not yet. The, the big thing is I watch very, very little TV. Uh, most of my media consumption is YouTube. However, um, it doesn't mean that if, it, if something's not good, I won't take the time. The biggest thing is I most what little TV I watch, other than inside football season... And when I watch my my typical Sunday religious prayer activity of screaming at the television for three hours while the Seahawks, uh, in this case, in the last season, lose, uh, <laughs> yeah, but usually they win. Yeah, they just they've been competitive for a while. Uh, it's not like the '90s when it was basically just you assumed we would lose almost every game, and when we got a win, you were like, "Miracles have happened." <laughs> um, I I, wa I watch like one show at a time with uh, my lady and brother-in-law James. So, like, when we're eating dinner, we'll typically watch an episode of a show, of whatever show we're watching. So, most recently, uh, we have been watching, for me, it's a rewatch, and same for my lady, but, uh, you know, this is, like, probably the fifth time I've seen it, the original Cowboy Bebop anime. Because brother-in-law James has never seen it. And with Netflix having put out the um, questionable <laughs> live-action version, I wanted to expose him to the original, because... If you're an anime fan, most people in the, the Japanese animation world would probably consider Cowboy Bebop perfect. It is one of the absolute icons of that entire like genre of media as being 
one of the most perfect things created. Uh, and it just it has a fantastic soundtrack. It has a great story. It it really has some weight to it, and it's beautiful at the same time for its for its era and time. It's beautiful animation, and it's got some great light humor mixed in with it too. So it's just fantastic, right? And getting an idea, letting letting brother in law James get an idea of this thing that is held in such high regard, and understanding why it's held in such high regard. And then we're probably going to go watch the live action version that Netflix made to um, depress ourselves at what Netflix has done. <laughs> oh man, I don't know what we're watching after that though. Good lord, <laughs> I don't know. If there's too much that will like instantly make me go like, yeah, I'm in to watch this. Although, uh, the show we watched before that was, uh, The Great, if any of you are familiar with that show. And I, I find the, uh, the comedy and the costuming in that show hilarious. Like, the, the costuming's beautiful, the, the, the subtle quips and jokes that are totally not accurate to history are just very enjoyable, and it's, it's pretty, pretty rompous. Not good for kids, though. Don't, don't let kids watch that at all. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let me see here. There's one other I need to get to. Paul Soltero. Blue discus tend to have bloat issues. That's interesting. Specifically the blue ones, huh? I wonder if it's a lot like um, African cichlid bloat where, you know, people feed them way too meaty foods compared to what they actually tend to eat. And there's that particular strain, a lot like African cichlids, they deal with bloat because they can't process that food. The ton of African cichlids, right, they have a lot more veg in their diet than we think because they eat quite a lot of algae in the wild and they don't actually eat like a very heavy meaty diet but people tend to feed them very heavy meaty diets and it goes horrifically wrong very very fast do 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 it's interesting so this is why that's how you know i'm not a big discus person i just love them i love the way they look uh kevin rosenberg I just set up all my Fluval lights to pro mode and working great. Just put the 2.0 Aqua Sky on my 33 long. Love it. Thanks. Nice. Getting gutsy. Going to pro mode land. I think for me, like, auto mode is really all you actually need. Pro mode is just when you're, like, a, a crazy person like me and you're like, I'm going to try and simulate an actual day and see what happens. And then, like, you just kind of guess it right. <laughs> And it turns out to be an amazing setting for growing your plants, but typically not getting too much algae. Although, I run my lights way longer than probably most people should. So, if you do have issues, try to compact the time frame that it's on, as opposed to necessarily bring the intensity down, and that might help. But, you've done a lot of stuff before, Kevin. And we've had some uh, some comments here and there, so I think, I think you're going to be alright. Uh, Jacob Hill, I know live foods are really good, but is hatching baby brine worth it for one to two tanks? Just buy frozen baby brine. You can get the... Uh, that assumes you have a place where you can easily get frozen food locally. Although there are plenty of places that will ship it. But you can get the little cubes of frozen baby brine from... Uh, I think it's Hikari, right? That makes the good stuff. Uh, and just feed it that way. Because between one or two tanks, you probably... The cubes are like a half cube in the baby brine. So you probably only need one cube in each tank. Uh, and just like... Put the cube in some water first and let it melt in there and then just pour that into the tank and it's basically like putting fresh baby brine in although if you have lots of small fry and you're worried about hurting them uh you could do it by just sucking it up with a pipette and dosing it in gently you'll be all right if you only if you only have one to two tanks it's probably not worth doing live baby brine because you make way more brine than you actually need or you need a very small like hatching container that you have to home build yourself you can also get, uh, who is it that makes, there's like a decapsulated, uh, brine egg. <laughs> Trying to remember, I think it's, uh, who makes it? It's in a little glass jar. And I'm sure there's a lot of other places that make them that are pre-done for you. As opposed to the things you're going to hatch. But you keep them in your fridge. I'm trying to find the the actual product I know. I used to I bought it at co-op a few times before. Do here it is. Uh, Ocean Nutrition makes it. Let me see if it's on 
the Amazon so I can give you a link so you can at least see it. Ocean Nutrition. Instant baby brine shrimp is what they call it. Bingo, bango. We found it. Come on. Give me a link. There we go. Bonk. And we got to put the FTC disclaimer. All right, there it is in chat. Uh, so Ocean Nutrition makes this little jar. It's like 0.7 ounces or whatever. It's tiny. It's 20 grams of instant baby brine shrimp. And basically, you can just take a little pipette in it, take a little bit out, and boom, done. And you just keep it in your fridge. And it lasts for a good amount of time after you've opened it. But you can feed it to your big fish, too. Don't be afraid. They'll love it. It's slightly larger than if you hatch true fresh baby brine. Okay, but not by much. So depending on what kind of fish you have, that's a good option. And just for the FTC to not find me, if you do make a purchase through that link that I put in chat, I am an Amazon affiliate and I will receive a small commission from qualifying purchases made through the links I use in chat. Thank you, FTC. Please don't find me. I've done my due diligence. <laughs> I... I I both hate and love that I need to do that because it lets me be kind of sarcastic about it. But <laughs> Oh, man. Kingfisher's Catch, Joe, one of my boosts, insert crazy name, <laughs> has flowered. I recently changed my dosing regime uh, to little, but often. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So micro dosing more often instead of one big dose, right? The way that I tend to preach of like spread your dosing out over every day as or as more often instead of like a big dose once or twice a week is done the trick yeah you'll notice that like with a lot of those flowering plants that can flower underwater when they get a consistent dose of nutrients they're more likely to flower and they get way happier way fast way happier way fast it's, that's correct english i promise <laughs> oh man we're getting close we got the it's my my aussie buddy in chat I've not seen Dr. Black in chat. I'm trying to figure out if he's streaming tonight. I'm trying to give my, my buddy some love because I I kind of sent you all to my club last week instead of Dr. Black. I don't see anything. Maybe he's got the week off. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Might not be having a beverage. We'll see in a minute, though. He might show up in chat. You never know. Never know. Do, 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 do. Oh my lord. Bob Purcell, what are you trying to do? <laughs> Bob Purcell. <clears throat> I was on a stream where the host shaved his mustache when he got some threshold. Think we can get Bentley Pasco to do that. Do you know how hard it is for me to grow facial hair? I'll tell you this. Okay, this is where we get one of those Bentley non fish related stories. I went gray in my hair. As you can see, this this silverback gorilla thing going on in my head, right? I have been this gray since I was 19. I started going visibly gray, like you could see the salt and pepper in my hair at 12. It was like I hit puberty and started going gray. <laughs> very, very fast. I had... Maybe half of my hair gray by the time I was 16. And then just over the next three years, this this majestic mop was done. And I could find like five remaining of my original brown hair is left in my head. Like nothing. But I get to keep my hair. All right. Now, 19, full gray head of hair. Still can't grow a beard. Still could not grow a beard. I was in my early 20s. Uh, when did we do this? My younger brother was 12. So I was 23. When we went on vacation to uh, Orlando, Florida. Because my kid brother had, had never been to an amusement park that wasn't like the tiny one, basically, that's at the state fair. And my mom wanted to let him have the Disney experience. He's 12. Okay? I'm 23. <laughs> I decided, because of how ludicrously hot 
in the last week of July, first week of August, Orlando, Florida is for my uh, Northwest living fat butt that I was not going to try and shave because I have freshly shaved face and it would just, I'd be sweating like crazy because it's so hot. I'm not very good in hot weather, if that's not obvious. And it would just burn my face, like, constantly. I learned that on the first day and decided, okay, I'm not shaving for the rest of the week. So, a week and a half while I'm there, I, I don't shave anything. And I barely had visible hair here. Everywhere else was still peach fuzz. Yeah, none of the color that used to be up here, that brown that I once had, that became gray, none of that escaped down my face. This did not grow in the way it is now until I was 24. I spent six months growing this in from the end of 23 until I turned 24 to get this grown in enough to where it was visible. I still did not have this part, the mustache, this little... So part my dad, this is the only facial hair he can grow as a mustache. He's got one of those like durable 70s ones. <laughs> but that's how I know my dad's old school. This finally started coming in when I was 25. And to get color in it all. Color in here about when I turned 25. Color here when I was 26. I was almost 30 before. This part here connected where the mustache, I used to have like a gap like this. I've never been able to grow hair here except for like a singular line of individual hairs a little weld in my chin. I've never been able to grow facial hair here. So like the soul patch, I can't grow it. And this, if I don't shave that for a week, you might notice it, but it's so like, sparse that it basically doesn't exist and the only i don't get really color up here i kind of get some color down here but it doesn't look like a beard so if i were to shave this off which conveniently hides my double chin on my fat butt it would probably take me three to four months to grow this thing back in my significant other quite likes my facial hair and is terrified at the thought of me removing this because as a fat person if I remove this, I immediately become a baby face. And while I have this this beautiful swath of hair in this silvery color that makes me look like I'm 900, the rest of this will make me look like I'm 15. <laughs> so, the short answer is, man, I shave my beard. It took way too long to grow this stupid thing in. <laughs> I ain't getting rid of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right so we might do some other stuff so i'm more likely to give stuff away when i hit thresholds that's what's fun for me but um i would be more likely to do like some non-fish related fun thing as opposed to like say shave my face or shave my head and I could shave my head, but then I'd just wear a hat over it and you would never see it, right? You would, and, and it won't do anything. I'm just I'm all gray anyway. <laughs> and I do shave this. I need to go get a haircut. This is getting long on the sides here, but I've been too dang busy. Too dang busy. All right, all right, all right. So there, there's a story of why that will never happen and how terrible I am at growing any form of semblance of facial hair. Do, 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 do. We've got some anime discussion going on. What's up? That's how you know how far, far behind I am. Uh, Leo, test of the tap right now. 11KH, 14GH. Okay, so like your KH and GH are a little high. But not insane. It's still... You know, guppies will love that stuff. But yeah, I mean, if you want to cut it down a little bit, you could like 50-50 it. And it would bring it down to relatively neutral. And you'd probably do just fine. But you could also just see, like, if you go to... How many people keep bettas locally and don't mess with that? You know? Gorgachev, you have the hair color of a wizard. 
you're a wizard, Bentley. <laughs> I I uh I have been very fortunate that uh, all the significant others in my life uh much prefer the distinguished gray hair look and haven't been like you should dye your hair so you look younger <laughs> because I'm lazy and I don't want to keep dyeing my hair although for a while if I can find pictures ever I will definitely put them on the internet cuz I don't I have no shame when I was in high school when I still had some some brown color to my hair I used to uh, spike this upward in like a fan, and I bleached the front spikes. So I basically had this like peacock fan of hair spiked up, and I used to have this uh, this gel. It's like this black goop, basically, is the way I used to describe it. But it's normally used for people who have afros to hold them in place. And I used to use that stuff, so I might as well have been using like industrial strength glue to hold the spikes of my hair up in the morning. Yeah, that's the one time Bentley had a real weird hairdo. And then uh, I, I wore that for like a year until I saw three different people with a similar hairstyle and I immediately cut it off because it was no longer unique and weird. And and that was that was my MO back in high school. It's being a little a little little weird and unique. That was how I, I flew my, my crazy person flag. <laughs> you're getting you're getting exposed to like the, the psychosis that is Bentley, right? Right here in chat. Uh, da, 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 da. Knight Rider, uh, were you exposed to any radiation? My dad was at work and that side was always had less hair and white. No. Um, so I just come from people who <laughs> both sides of my family. So both my mom and my dad went gray early. Um, so I just went, I got like, I got it from both sides. I just went gray super early and my dad, nor really any of the men on my mom's side of the family were very good at growing facial hair. Um, her, her brother, my uncle, Steve, who passed away when I was pretty young. Um, he was able to grow like a goatee, kind of similar to what I have, but that's about it. He couldn't really grow much out this way. And my dad is very similar. He basically could only grow a mustache and he really can't grow anything anywhere else. So he's very typically clean shaven everywhere except for the mustache he has. That thing, I've never seen him without it ever, ever, my whole life. <laughs> you know, that's that's his thing. That's the one thing I just, it's there. It's just, very 70s with my father but you know he's a he's an old school kind of guy he works on hot rods and muscle cars and classics and all that kind of stuff that's his jam so he's got a he's got he's got to dip it back to the the olden times a little bit you know <laughs> oh no rico stan cut off the santa beard i could transplant a beard mm. <laughs> Too Cooley for Schooly. Still one of the funniest fish-related names I've ever seen in chat. I love your name so much, Cooley. I started going gray at 17. Yeah, I was fully gray at 19. Think about that. I was visibly gray at 12. Try to explain that when you're like, your your voice is cracking and it's trying to become deep. It's like these beautiful baritones to it, right? Try to get that radio voice coming in instead of sounding like a high-pitched little boy. <laughs> and you're already going gray. Just... Voices cracking, gray hairs coming in. Oof. <laughs> Just big oof. <laughs> that was my young life, man. That's why I'm I'm the whack ball I am today. I just I've had enough stuff. Just maybe like like the Joker just made me plumb crazy. <laughs> Missing icorn. Never do something that stupid for views and likes. Giving stuff is great, but never disrespect yourself. I, I don't see, like... I don't know. The people who do fun stuff like that, it's just having fun with their chat, right? I, and and their, their viewers who are there regularly. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy that I like to watch for... Uh, when I was doing a lot of Diablo 2 and Diablo 2 Resurrected came out. Um, Mr. Llama SC is his, his username on Twitch and YouTube. And he was celebrating a big milestone where basically, like, they're doing this, uh, there's a charity stream or whatever, and they were raising donations for this charity. And after they hit certain milestones, you'd spin on this wheel, and one of the wheels was that his girlfriend would, like, start waxing and or shaving, depending on what it was, you know, parts of his body. So, like, he ended up with, like, his arms, his legs all waxed off, <laughs> waxed his chest. Uh, you gotta admit, it's a guy. He's not crazy hairy or anything, but still, like, 
you don't do this stuff so you're not used to it. So it's like, he's just kind of like, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> and it generated a lot of money for charity. So, you know, sometimes you do the things you got to do to do the right thing. But for me, it's like, I don't look at it as a disrespect thing. If I was ever to do something outlandish, we'll say it like that. It would be because I, I think it's fun and interactive for people and not that I would feel it was ever disrespecting myself. I would never disrespect myself. I'm way too much of a like positive mind frame kind of person other than I love self-deprecating humor. And, and you have to understand, I love it because I enjoy it. I don't care how other people view it. I enjoy it. So I will self-deprecate like crazy because it makes me giggle at myself because I'm a dum-dum. And that's how I operate. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the truth of my life, man. I'm a crazy person. Fair and graph, I have a Bluevel 32 Flex. Man, the 32. That thing is so cool, but I don't have room for it. I have two Skylight Program Bluevel lights, so two of the Aqua Skies in it. What's a good percent of the colors to set up for a planted tank? So it depends a lot on the kind of plants you're using. If you're really only using like low and medium light plants, um, I would look toward in my Fluval Ultimate Guide. I have an Ultimate Guide. I'll, I'll help you find it. For the Aquas Guy itself. No, not Ultimate Guitar. What are you trying to do? And, uh, da, 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 da. where's my part two? I honestly, in most of this, I would probably only ever use auto mode. You don't really need pro mode, although you could use my pro mode settings. Here's a link to that video. That's the part two where I cover my auto. Use the shallow mode settings if you're doing low or medium light demands. If you have high light demands, then you could use... The, the normal one that I use that I just, I think I call like a summer day or something like that, right? I think it's the first setting I cover in that video. And you'll do just fine. It'll give you a good medium light. But because that tank's shallower than the tank I'm doing it in, it's actually going to tinge into highlight at the upper portions and be medium light down your substrate. Should do just fine and dandy for you, especially with two lights. It was low and medium light on... A 40 breeder with only one light. Just does that stuff. I derail fish talk. No worries, Bob. No worries, Bob. Uh, this is probably my last one for the night. All right, maybe I can chain these really fast. New Mexico Aquatics. In your opinion, one of the differences between API root tabs, Seachem Flourish root tabs, Aquarium Co-op root tabs, I own all three. Thank you. Uh, it's how you plant them. That's it. So you can flourish for tabs because they're not one of the capsulated ones are a lot easier to just dig down to your substrate. And they're not going to float up. You need a thicker substrate to more properly plant the capsulated tabs. And about almost all of them are going to feature some amount of dirt in them, which Corey talks about. Uh, there's a little bit more that's in the co-op root tab, and that's because it's good mineralized soil, which is nice. Uh, the only difference really comes down to cost and what you prefer. If you have access to the co-op root tabs, they're great, especially if you have a really deep substrate. You have a thin, a not as deep substrate. I'm talking like four inches or more. I would look at the CM Kim Flourish root tabs. I personally use those. I love them to death, but I don't use root tabs super often. So if you use them a lot, you might want to find the one that is most cost efficient for you, which most likely is Aquarium Co-op. Could be API. All depends on what kind of price point you're getting at and how many and all that kind of stuff. That's for you to kind of do a little bit, a little bit of math make it easy on yourself they're roughly all similar i will say that the nutrient balance in co-op and flourish is slightly better than api which is funny because i'll dog on flourish liquid all day long but i love flourish root tabs so figure that one out right and then <clears throat> jacob hill one more one more one more my golden coin Anubis started turning yellow, and the leaves are kind of see-through after moving it to a high-tech from a low-tech. Nitrogen efficiency. Now that it's in high-tech, it's getting more light, it's getting CO2, it can consume more nutrients, and it's probably fighting with all these really aggressive growing plants in a high-tech setup where it's more passive. So we need to find a way to get more nutrients to that plant. And it depends. There's yellowing patterns, and it depends on the pattern, but... Uh, go look up 
online, you can literally do a Google search that says aquarium plant deficiency chart. You'll find two different ones. One covers micros, one covers macros. Just look at the pictures. It will literally guide you all the way you need. Or, or if we really want to go down this way, Bentley, that handy fellow, he's got a nice thing all about micros and macros in his Fertilizer 101 about how to solve your plant issues. So, bump, 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 bump. Let's see here. Bang. There it is. I gotta, I gotta find myself talking. And that would be this video right here. That is Aquatic Plants Dying. Learn how and why to save them. Easy peasy. Teach you all about the different deficiencies. Has little pictures. Yeah, it is too bad I don't have a mod to do these links for me. Jeez. Jeez. Where's candy when I hear? I'm kidding. I care more about mods who like monitor chat better than me because I'm typically like a mile and a half behind the chat. <laughs> Till we get to the end. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, if I did not get your question, please, 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 by all means, shoot me an email, bentley.pasco at gmail.com. I'll put it in chat one more time. If I can spell my own name correctly. So I'm sitting a little like side saddle on my keyboard. Shoot me an email. I do warn you. <laughs> It's, right now, I'm like two weeks behind. Uh, I just used this particular email that I used as a topic for today because it was quick, and I recognized the person as one of the members, and, uh, you know, I try to be really nice to you members when I can because you deserve it. You're good people, and you, you, you give me your American pesos when you don't have to. So I need to give a little love back. That being said, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope you all have had a lovely evening and have a wonderful week. Look forward to the first episode of the Fish Room Tour. Some of you have been demanding that for a while. That is coming out this Saturday, assuming that I don't have some major hiccup in the editing. As always, thank you so much for watching. And stay awesome. Also... Does anybody else think that the kitty goes meow in the uh, the playoffs and maybe the Bengals will finally not be the Bungles? Huh? Huh? I'm kind of hoping. Kind of hoping. Have a good night, folks. <laughs>